You know, I have been preaching for the past few weeks on, on the election, probably been coming from a different direction than you thought it might be. I just want you to know that there's, there's something far greater than Democrats and Republicans in this coming election, something far greater than our nation, and that's Jesus Christ. He is the King of kings and the Lord of lords. And if you, got, if you if one takeaway from the past weeks, keep your eyes, your focus, your heart on Jesus Christ, King of kings and Lord of lords. That's exactly who he is. Psalm 133 teaches us something about us, and this is the heart I've wanted us to cultivate as we've gone into this season, how good and pleasant it is when brothers vote the right way. Oh, wait a minute. It says live together in unity. And I'll point out unity does not mean uniformity, but we need to learn to love one another. When brothers live together in unity, and this is what God says, it's like precious oil poured on the head, running down on the beard, running down on Aaron's beard, down upon the collar of his robes. It is as if the dew of Hermon were falling on Mount Zion. Look at this, the promise. For there, there the Lord bestows his blessing, even life forevermore. That's the place of commanded blessing. That's where God bestows his blessing. That's where God commands his blessing, even life forevermore. I want all of us to have one heart, one mind, one spirit, and we're going to keep our eyes on Jesus Christ. Amen? Amen. Father, we ask you to open up your word to us today. I can't teach it. I can't preach it. I just want to say that from the get-go. Lord, fill this house with your glory. Fill this house with you, Lord Jesus. Holy Spirit, come and bring honor and glory and praise to Jesus Christ today. You know we're facing a lot of stuff. We don't know the end from the beginning, but you do. We don't know what's going to happen in the next four years, but you do. We're just honoring you today as King of kings and Lord of lords. May that be our heart and our spirit and our mind. Help us to just live together in that spirit of unity where you command your blessing, even life forevermore. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. During the past week or so, how many have been getting a lot of voting advice? In the mail and on TV, it's fun. I'm, I'm, I was playing a Bethel music this morning. I got a, I got an ad for Camella, followed by a Christian song, followed by an ad for Trump, followed by a Christian song. It's like, yeah, there's a lot of kind of mixed in there, isn't there? We got a whole lot of stuff going on. Do I, do I vote because of the mailers? How about lawn signs? Is that really a good way to vote? Most lawn signs wins. <laughs> it's funny. Four years ago, when I was also had a little, was a little ambivalent about some of the election stuff, I was going to vote for a guy named Nolan Painting. He had a lot of signs around the neighborhood, and I thought, Mr. Nolan Painting, he's probably a hard-working fella. It'd be a good, good choice, but turned out I was kind of off on that one. Um, <laughs> that happens. It was funny because Taylor Swift, the day she, she announced for who she was voting for, she got like 68,000 people jumping on that bandwagon. Well, well there, there's a real good way to, to vote. You know, who does, who does the pop singer like the best? Elon Musk, you know, obviously a fan of Donald Trump. You see him with him a whole lot. Um, should I vote for somebody because Elon likes him? How about President Obama? He, he, he was on a lot of things. Really, chiding is about the kindest word I could say. Chiding black men because they weren't standing up enough for Kamala. Uh, should I vote because President Obama says so? What do I do? What can I look at? I got veterans for this person. I got conservatives for Harris. I got uh, one TV, actually several are already declaring winners which is kind of amazing. We don't even have to vote. The winner's already been declared by the TV. What a wonderful nation this is. They know stuff Jesus doesn't know yet. Well, Jesus does know, but I don't know. <laughs> Hadn't told me. So trying to, trying to keep this kind of uh, in the right spot here. Last, last few weeks we've been looking at preparing our, preparing our hearts, making sure our hearts are in the right place, because remember, judgment begins with the, the family of God, right? The household of God starts with us. Let's get us right before we start. It really helps your discernment everywhere else when we get the, the proverbial specks and logs out of our own eyes, doesn't it? Yeah. Talked about preparing our minds. How, do we have, how can we have a mind of Christ and apply it to some of the, the things we're facing in the election? But more from a spiritual aspect, remembering God is over every government, that most of the governments in the past have been wicked. I'm not talking about just worldwide or our country. I'm talking about the governments of Israel, his chosen people. Most of them were not godly. Most of them were downright evil, especially after they separated. The northern tribes, not one godly king at all, what, what 31 or whatever it was, it was just not much. <laughs> Zero is not a, not a high, high standard there. Preparing our spirits. We want to choose to follow Jesus Christ. This is my election. This is, this is the election message. I'm going to get into some issues today, but we want to start with choosing to follow Jesus Christ. Amen? 
because he's king of kings and and he's the ruler of the kings of the earth, Revelation 1.5. You might remember that. So we want to choose to follow Jesus. We want to choose to walk in unity. We want to choose to walk in unity with people we may not even agree with. If you and I are disagreeable Christians about this election, if we put up our candidate ahead of Jesus Christ, anybody that isn't voting for our candidate will think that they have to vote like I do to get saved. Do I want that? Do you want that? No king but Caesar. That was a cry back then. Was that a good good call or bad call? Bad call. Bad call. Um, the apostle Paul, see, he said, you, you know, you think you follow Peter. You, you, you follow, you follow uh, uh, Apollos. You follow, you follow me. You follow Christ. They thought they were spiritual. I'm following this most, I'm following this person. And Paul didn't say, no, the one, he said, he didn't say, you got it right. You're the spiritual one. He said, all you guys, you're all carnal. You're, you're fleshly. You're, you're walking in the natural. You're, you're acting like just regular human beings. We want to have the mind of Christ in this whole thing, right? That's what we're looking for. So we're, He didn't say they were spiritual, though. He said they were carnal, fleshly. Remember historically, going back through some of what we've been learning together, God's chosen people missed a whole lot. Now, now just think of how people have, I'm, I'm talking about voting now, how they voted in the past. God's chosen people they chose a golden calf and wanted to choose a leader to take them back to Egypt rather than Moses and God. Good call or bad call? They voted for a king, King Saul, over God. God even pointed out, he says, they've rejected me. Good call or bad call? Bad call. They voted for Barabbas over Jesus. He was the freedom fighter. Good call or bad call? Bad call. They voted for Caesar over Jesus. We have no king but Caesar, if you're, a friend of, if you're a friend of Jesus, if you let him go, you're no friend of Caesar's, chose Caesar over Jesus. Good call or bad call? And the subtext of that is they voted for their religion and their temple over Jesus. Man, if I, if I vote for my church over Jesus Christ, I have missed it. Amen? Now, I like it here, but I don't want to miss it. I don't want to miss it. We had a lot of really good, important issues identified last week. Were you able to pull up that uh, that issue sheet from last, that thing, that cool uh, uh, graphic from last week? Yeah, here we go. Um, I asked you guys, what issues are important to this election? And, and we had a lot of good ones. I, I wrote them all down off of that. I got them in the back of my, my notes here. Um, probably every one of us would agree. Aren't all those issues pretty good? A anybody against education? Anybody against money? Anybody against health care? Anybody against good energy? Anybody? You know what I mean? This is all good stuff, right? And no matter where we came from, politically, we're all kind of able to say these are all good things. That's a good start. And we could get along with that. Isn't that awesome? Um, I think they're all important. We might not agree on how best to do it. And that's where the politics comes in. But we could agree that they're good. But I think a really good first step for us as Christians is, and this is not just us, but everywhere, Let's determine to walk in unity because when we're walking and living in unity, God commands his blessing there. How many like the blessing of God in their life? God, God promises that when we seek first his kingdom and his righteousness. And that's a truth all through scripture, isn't it? Yeah. Seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and all these things will be given to you, added to you as well. Okay. Now I called this message, how might Jesus vote? Which sounds kind of nervy to say it. Um, it'd probably be more accurate to say, what kinds of things would Jesus say were important to God the Father, from his perspective, for us to really work at? So I want to talk about God's eye view in election. What kind of things would he think are pretty important? I think that list from last week is pretty good, don't you? Good stuff, yeah. We're going to look at some of those. And as always, we're going to dig a little deeper into things that the Bible talks about and, and why. These are, these are not in order, but I, I picked seven or, or however, however far we get of things I think we ought to think about. Let's go to Joshua 24, verse 14, and I'll also put that up on the screen for you. Some of these we'll do quite quickly. Others I'll dig in a little bit if the Lord gives me freedom to do that. Uh, first one is this. I think freedom of religion is a good thing to vote for. I think that's good. It's guaranteed by the Constitution, correct? Yeah. Um, it's important, it's good, I vote for freedom of religion. Cool? But I have to remember that it also allows for a whole lot of religions that I don't agree with. 
to be here too. Hmm. May not care for that, but that's that's part of the, that's part of the deal. The God's eye view is always this. Joshua 24, 14 and 15. I could show you this a lot of spots, and you know them too. They're getting ready to enter the promised land, or actually they're in there, and Joshua's getting ready to depart. It says, now fear the Lord and serve him with all faithfulness. Throw away the gods your forefathers worshipped beyond the river that would have been back um, the Euphrates and in Egypt and serve the Lord. But if serving the Lord seems undesirable to you, if you don't want to follow God, if serving the Lord seems undesirable to you, then choose for yourselves this day whom you will serve, whether the gods your forefathers served beyond the river or the gods of the Amorites, that's the, Canaan, the land of Canaan that they're in right now and whose land you're now living, this is it. This is the God's perspective for freedom of religion. But as for me and my household, we will serve the Lord. Let's say that out loud together. But as for me and my household, we will serve the Lord. That's what freedom of religion looks like. I choose to freely worship God. Re- re- remember this scripturally. Um, most, of the, most of the Bible is written in places and two places where freedom of religion did not exist. D- Daniel was in a place where he was supposed to be, you know, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego forced to bow down to a god. You know, I mean, the, you, you bow down or die. That is not freedom of religion, <laughs> right? <laughs> okay. Uh, um, and the Bible praises people who did that. Uh, Moses, uh, Joseph, Daniel, many of the prophets. Do you know who else was under an ungodly, no freedom of religion place? Jesus. That was not freedom of religion there. There was some toleration, but it was not free. You couldn't do that. The apostles, the whole early church, there was no freedom of religion. In fact, there was mostly persecution. But from a God's eye view, do you follow me? As for me and my household, we're going to serve the Lord. So whatever happens, election-wise or whatever, let's, let's make sure that we remember God is king. God's on the throne. He got this covered. Okay, It's, it's hard to swallow sometimes because some of the things that happen out there I don't like. <laughs> okay, you guys might be okay. Second one was this. This isn't on everybody's radar, but it, it used to be a lot more. It, it, let's go to Genesis chapter 12, verse 2 and 3. And I'm going to go through some of these pretty pretty quickly, Mr. Doug, just when we, once we get there. I'm sorry, yeah, Genesis 12, 2 and 3. The Lord told Abram, who's going to be called Abraham, leave your, your country, your people, your father's household, and go to the land I'll show you. They're not yet in the promised land. This is what he promised Abraham. I will make you into a great nation, and I will bless you. I will make your name great, and you will be a blessing. Here's the kicker. I will bless those who bless you, and whoever curses you, I will curse. And all peoples on earth will be blessed through you. I think God cares from a God's eye view. First thing is freedom of religion is you and me choosing to follow God no matter what. Second one is how do we as a nation deal with Israel? How do we feel about Israel? How does God deal with Israel? Now, Pretty much everything I'm going to say, there, there's going to be a possibility for a yeah, but I'm going to try to be equally sensitive to step on everybody's feet as much as I can to keep it even, all right? If you're all mad at me, that's I feel like I did my job. Because uh, I could say something like, we need to stand with Israel. And if your response is, oh, so, oh, so you think Israel should be allowed to do whatever they want to and go kill Palestinians? Not exactly where I was going with that. You see what I mean? And we, we do that all the time, all the time. I'm going to talk about immigration a little bit, but if I say something about, I think we need to be sensitive of how we handle immigration. Somebody says, oh, so you think you should allow rapists into the country? It wasn't, I don't remember saying that exactly. <laughs> let's, let's kind of back off just a little bit on the rhetoric and think about what we're thinking about. <laughs> let's think about this. Israel, Deuteronomy 28, verse 7. Let me just pop these real quick. The Lord, will, This is why we want to stand with Israel. The Lord will grant that the enemies who rise up against you will be defeated before you. They will come at you from one direction, but flee from you in seven. That's happened in the past, despite of a lot of other stuff. I want to be on the right side of that equation. Isaiah 49, 25. Come, O Zion, escape you who live in the daughter of Babylon. For this is what the Lord Almighty says. After he has honored me and has sent me against the nations that have plundered you, the ones that attacked Israel, for whoever touches you touches the apple of his eye. We've got to remember when God sometimes used nations to discipline Israel, but God said, that's my kid. I love those people. Stay on the right side of this equation. Zechariah chapter 2, verse 7 to 9. 
I will surely raise my hand against them so that their slaves will plunder them. Then you will know that the Lord Almighty has sent me. Did, you, did we get a, did I just give you, I didn't give you the whole thing. Sorry about that. The point is, God's going to fight for his people. Psalm 105, verse 12 to 15. When indeed they were but few in number, talking about Israel, wandering in the desert, few in, indeed and strangers in it, they wandered from nation to nation, from one kingdom to another. Remember 40 years in the desert, right? He allowed no one to oppress them. For their sake, he rebuked kings. Do not touch my anointed ones. Do my prophets no harm. Just saying, God is close to Israel. What's my part in this? I want to stand with Israel. Doesn't mean I necessarily agree with everything they do. Doesn't mean that we shouldn't stand up and say, hey, let's not do that. Okay, we, we have, we have op opportunities to speak into a lot of national interests. I'm, I'm not saying everything they do is right. I'm saying let's make sure we're on the right side of the equation in the big sense. My one son asked me a really good, good, good question, and I, I think it's something we want to have in our heart. How do the Palestinians feel about this? Did I hear not good, bro? <laughs> not, yeah, not good, bro. But let's, let's remember that it's, it's not just one nation. We're all in context. But for those of you that are in the Revelation class, we're going to see this week when all the nations are going to be gathered against Israel. We want to make sure that we're on the right side of that equation. This doesn't mean I approve everything they do. I also pray for my leaders and those in authority, and I don't agree with everything they do either. Follow me? Okay. But on the big sense, God's eye view, stand with Israel. Got to do that. What, what, what else can I do? Psalm 122, verse 6 to 9. Pray for the peace of Jerusalem. May those who love you be secure. May there be peace within your walls and security within your citadels. For the sake of my brothers and friends, I will say, peace be within you. For the sake of the house of the Lord our God, I will seek your prosperity. We can choose to stand with Israel. We can choose to pray for Jerusalem. Cool? Pray for Israel. Is that all right? Anybody think it's a bad thing to pray for Israel? All right, just making sure we're shaking this out here. Um, Ecclesiastes chapter 5. This, is, this would be important to me. It's something that's, again, not on everybody's radar for the election, but our Constitution is important in our country. I don't put it at the same level as the Word of God, but understand, it's still a good thing, okay? All right? That's what we got. That's our government right now. Um, I want freedom of religion. I want to stand with Israel. I want a leader, especially the president, that will keep their oath, that will keep their promise, that will do what they say they're going to do. Even my paint store, Sherwin Williams used to have it on the, on, the, on the wall. Do what you say you will do. That's pretty basic. Trained my kids to do that, hopefully. <laughs> I have to ask their bosses, I guess. The oath of office, the president is going to stand up, whoever that's going to be, and when they get the oath, they're going to promise to preserve, protect, and defend the Constitution. Who's going to defend the Constitution? Who's going to do that? I want to know that. A God's eye view is this. Verse 4 of Ecclesiastes 5, when you make a vow to God, that's a promise they're making, that's a vow. When you make a vow to God, do not delay in fulfilling it. He has no pleasure in fools. Fulfill your vow. It is better not to vow than to make a vow and not fulfill it. Do not let your mouth lead you into sin. And do not protest to the temple messenger, my vow was a mistake. Why should God be angry at what you say and destroy the work of your hands? Kind of, kind of powerful thought, isn't it? Let's the Bible says in, in Psalm 15, 4, one of the things God blesses is those that, that keep their promises even to their hurt. Do what you say you're going to do. I want a leader that will keep his oath and do what he promises to do, or she promises to do, what they promise to do, them, whoever they are. <laughs> I guess I'd also like to throw this in there too. I'd like a leader who will let the election be the election. Let me tell you what I mean by that. I don't want, if Trump wins, I don't want the Harris followers saying, oh, he bought the election. And if Harris wins, I don't want Trump saying, oh, she stole the election. Grow up. Put on your big boy pants or whatever you wear, your little big girl panties, whatever you, whatever you put on, whatever it is you put on, let's grow up and be mature and say you won, fair and square. Let's have an election and be done and, and not do make lawsuits go on forever. Uh, this is partly opinion, but it's partly based on this. That's part of preserving and protecting and defending the Constitution when you, elect, when you let election results stand, because the election came out of that, right? Somebody didn't just think of that as a good idea. No, it started out a long time ago. 
Uh, that's three. Fourth one is this. Genesis chapter 1, verse 26 and 27. Very beginning of your Bible. It says, Then God said, Let us make man in our image, in our likeness, and let them rule over the fish of the sea and the birds of the air, over the livestock, over all the earth, and over all the creatures that move along the ground. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created them. Something that's really important to me in the election, again, God's eye view. God's eye view is freedom of religion is my choice. God's eye view is bless Israel. That's, that's a nation that's important to him. God's eye view is let your yes be yes and your no, no. Do what you say you're going to do. God's eye view is this. Family's important. Family's important. It's, it's hard for any one candidate anymore to claim high moral ground when it comes to family. But you and I need to stand for family. God did that. He made the first people, right? Made Adam. He made Eve. That's the first couple. And you know what it said? It said male and female, he created them. I support that. I think that's a good thing. He made them male and female. That's how it works. I'm not going to get into the whole transgender thing right now, but rest assured that is not of God. No, no hate, no, no, nothing else except speaking the word. That is not a God. We'll talk some other time about. Uh, I, I went through, I went through the, the transgender laws for all 50 states because I wanted to be, be ready to be accurate on this. We've got a dozen states that are, this was written by a, a gender-affirming group, so it's not like conservative wackos or whatever. It's not far, far right or lefts or whatever. Um, a dozen of them. Are, they're, they're designated themselves as sanctuary states. Some of them are, even under Obamacare, Obamacare technically needs to pay for transgender operations because they're not allowed to discriminate for r sex or gender identity. It's kind, kind of powerful. Vermont made it a law that insurance companies have to cover gender-changing operations. Washington State has it set that teenagers don't even need parental permission. They can go there, and if their parents won't take them, they will provide housing for them and take care of them and pay for their operations. It's, I, I think we're switching the price tags. I think we're setting good for evil and evil for good. Uh, man, we want to be loving and accepting and forgiving, but again, let's keep our eyes on what God's Word says, and I'm not going to make everybody do what, what I think the Bible says, right? But let's make sure we act out of a heart of love, okay? All right? However... God made them male and female, and in fact, it goes on in uh, Genesis 2, 24, it says, for this reason, a man will leave his father and mother, be united to his wife, and they will become one flesh. First family, first marriage, that was all whose idea? God's. This is, we're, I'm not making up social stuff, and I don't care about what the mores and folkways are of our culture, but let's keep our eyes on what the Word of God is. Uh, whatever people do, I can't, can't help that but let's not do anything that's going to undermine the basic unit of the family. This kind of goes along with the next one. So the, the God's eye view of the next one, how many think education is important? It is to God, too. Let's go to Gen uh, Deuteronomy chapter 6. Doing a whole lot of scripture today because I'm really, I think the Bible has a lot to say about everything. You know, let's, let's check that out. And if you want to think of this, look at it some other way. No, no, no bad feelings for me because I choose to walk in love with everybody. It's my choice, my choice. Deuteronomy 6, verse 4. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. Love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your strength. These commandments that I give you today are to be on your hearts. Impress them on your children. What? Impress them on your children. Talk about them when you sit at home, when you walk along the road, when you lie down, and when you get up. Tie them as symbols on your hands, bind them on your foreheads, write them on the door frames of your houses and on your gates. Let's look at another one, Psalm 78. Don't wait for there. Psalm 78, I'll do verses 1 to 8. I want to have it in my Bible so that I, I can look down and... O oh, my people, hear my teaching. Listen to the words of my mouth. And the New Testament identifies this as a prophetic passage. I will open my mouth in parables. Who spoke in parables? Jesus. I will utter things hidden from of old, what we have heard and known, what our fathers have told us. We will not hide them from their children. 
we will tell the next generation the praiseworthy deeds of the Lord, his power, and the wonders he has done. He decreed statutes for Jacob and established the law in Israel, which he commanded our forefathers, commanded our forefathers to teach their children, so the next generation will know them, even the children yet to be born, and they in turn would tell their children. Then they would put their trust in God and would not forget his deeds, but would keep his commands. They would not be like their forefathers, a stubborn, rebellious generation whose hearts were not loyal to God, whose spirits were not faithful to him. God's view of education is this. Parents, teach your children. Now, a, a number of us years ago, we chose to do homeschooling, home education. Not everybody's qualified or equipped or feels like they can. Fine, you're not all called to do that. But I do want to stress this. Whether it's private school, public school, home education, whatever you do, make sure you as parents, you have the primary responsibility for training your child. Do not, do not wind up with a mess and blame the teacher. All right? This is on you. This is, this is us, you and me, taking responsibility to train our... The Bible says, train up a child in the way they should go. That's not, that's not just for the schools. That's for us. Uh, you want to hold school boards accountable? If you really care about what's going into them, get involved with that. That's going to be at the local level. I'll tell you what, you know, uh, Trump and Harris are not going to be stopping by your elementary school to talk about curriculum. Get, get on the school board. Do something like that if that's, if that's an issue that's... Th a big deal to you, but the idea is parents take responsibility for training your children. That's the God's eye view. Amen? You can delegate it, but it's up to us. And I'll tell you, parents, it's a scary thing because I'll guarantee you we're going to do it wrong sometimes. We just do. Well, you give it your best shot. You take responsibility. You say, as for me and my household, we will serve the Lord, and it's all going to trickle down to that. Follow me? Okay. These, these are God's eye views of election issues. Next one is money. How many... How many like money in truly the godly sense? They once asked a fellow, uh, John Rockefeller, you know, he was a, one of the richest men in the world at the time, how much money would it take to make you truly happy? And with a twinkle in his eye, reportedly, he said, just a little bit more. <laughs> and sometimes we live like that. So that's not exactly where I'm going. Um, I want to just make this clear. Understand this. God does love to bless his people. The church went through a whole time where, 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 man, poor Christians, we're going to just be poor, but in heaven, you know, it's going to be okay there. It's going to be a miserable time here. Heaven's going to be good. Listen, God desires to bless you here on earth and up there. That, that's, to me, that's clear. You don't believe it, that's fine. You can be as miserable as you want to be. Just don't do it around me. Nationally, I want to look <laughs> nationally, <laughs> better fake joy than genuine depression. <laughs> Nationally, I want to just give a quick look at our current spending and debt, and there's a couple reasons for this. Number one, debt is a sign of God's judgment on a nation. Debt is a sign that there's something that isn't right. It should be a war sign to Christians. Like walking along, if you're if you're walking or whatever, and all of a sudden it starts to really hurt, uh, you might sit down and see if you got a pebble in your shoe. Right? It's diagnostic. This is a diagnostic thing. When we see certain things happening, God's saying, pay, pay attention. Look at this. Sit down, take your shoe off, and get a look at what's going on inside there. This should be a warning shot to Christians, but I fear it isn't. I don't think we have a clue how to do money. Deuteronomy 28.12. I'm going to look at it just a couple real fast here. The Lord will open the heavens, the storehouse of his bounty, to send rain on your land in season and to bless all the work of your hands. How many does that sound good? Yeah. You will lend to many nations but borrow from none. Now, if I'm borrowing from many nations and lending to none, what's, there's a problem, you see? That's not what God had in mind. How about Proverbs 22, verse 7? The rich rule over the poor, and the borrower is servant of the lender. A nation in debt is becoming a servant nation. This is not good. Um, so that's the first thing. Na debt is a sign of God's judgment. We need to have that on our radar. I don't think we always do because nobody wants to talk about it because, well, I'll get into that in a minute. <laughs> The second thing is this, you pay interest on all that debt. How many of you ever had like a loan, car loan, house loan? Did you notice you pay something called interest? Have you all seen that? Credit card, do you ever, you ever have that? Do you have to pay interest on that? They, they, they don't, if you borrow 100 bucks, they don't want 100 bucks back. They might want 150. If you let it go long enough, they might want your house. It goes fast. Interest money takes money that we could be using for other things. That's the problem. Interest takes money that we could put into something that we actually agreed with, like on our first thing. We could put that into education and health care and all that good stuff we like, right? Okay. 
Um, I want to give just a real quick view of government and money. I'm not going to do much of this. I'm a, I will admit that I will leave out a lot uh, just because just I can't. And this is something that, that people argue about. Economists argue about this stuff. But I want to give you as best I can a Christian perspective. These numbers are all from the IRS. This is not made up stuff. I didn't get it off, off YouTube or something like that. Our current budget, 675, I'm sorry, $6.75 trillion. Say that's a lot of money. That's a lot of money. Our deficit for this year, for 2024, $1.8 trillion. That's a lot of money. Deficit means I spent, as a, we spent as a nation, $1.8 trillion more than what we had. Parents, teach your children this. Teach them how to count to 10. Teach them, teach them how, to, how to, to, to deal with money. Teach them that if you spend more than you make, you will run out of money really fast. Teach that stuff. It's not taught in our schools. We got, we got guys going and, and they're, they're going for educational loans and they're getting what they call a financial aid package and they think that means that they're giving it to me. And they come out of school and they realize they wanted that financial aid package all paid back and now they owe fifty, eighty, hundred thousand dollars, two hundred thousand dollars for, for some of the big schools. And that's a lot of money if it's just you coming right out of school. That's not a good thing. They, they had no idea that was going to happen. Now, I don't blame all those kind of people for saying, now that they came out with their $200,000 debt, saying, yeah, I want the government to pay my student loan. More about that in a minute. But I'll tell you what, if you weren't faithful with it on the front end, I don't think you're going to be any better with it if I pay it off now. You still haven't learned. And they still don't realize that if I get all this money now, who's going to pay for that? Well, probably me. Because it's just one more thing that's thrown on that debt that we're already not able to pay off. When the Bible, um, yeah, Bible. When you hear it on the radio, people talk about, yeah, we're, we're, this is deficit spending. It makes it sound like it's some sort of economic good thing. All it means is you spent more than you made. $1.8 trillion is a whole lot more to spend more than you made. So every time there's a great program, oh, why doesn't the government do this? Why don't they do that? Why don't they take care of this? Because it keeps adding to that pile. It, it just makes it bigger and bigger and bigger. We have one pile. We've got to figure out how to sort this out, and that's not where I'm going today. What that means is for us right now, in the now, our gross national debt is $34 trillion. $34 trillion. That's probably more than a half a dozen of, the, of large nations all put together. Our interest payments, this is where I'm going with the debt, $1.2 trillion. That's gross for 2024. 1.2 trillion. Do you think that would pay for a whole lot of social programs and a whole lot of taking care of just about everything you could think of? Yeah, it could. All we're doing is we're throwing it away. We had times like that. I remember one of my daughters wanted to go to a to a, a beauty school, and we got there, and they wouldn't give her any financial aid. It was this guy says, "Huh, oh, that's funny. All these other kids are getting financial aid. You're not. Whatever." Uh, <laughs> went down through the list. Okay, yeah, we'll sign up. You know, whatever it takes. It would, have, it would have doubled the amount of the loan if I got financial aid from them. But we figured out we're going to scrimp and save and get this thing paid off because, daggone, I'm not going to double the cost of something in interest payments. I just refuse to do that. I want, this is opinion. This is not Bible. I want you to refuse to do that too. <laughs> Owe no man anything except the continuing debt to love one another. Let's stay out of debt. Let's do that. All right, real quick going through this. Um, in our country's budget, Health and Human Services is the biggest cabinet post. It gets $1.7 trillion. Social Security is second, $1.5 trillion. And I don't consider that a, a government gift because the people that are getting Social Security paid into Social Security. I don't think the government gives you a gift when they give you back what they took from you in the first place. Right? Okay, follow me? Okay. Not being mean about it, I'm just saying, let's not talk about it like we, we need to take that off from the, the seniors because they paid for that daggone thing. Third, you know what number three is on the list after Health and Human Services and Social Security? The third biggest item, debt, debt interest, $1.2 trillion. We've got $1.7 for the Health and Human. We've got $1.5 for Social Security, $1.2 for debt. Military spending drops down to $879 billion. I mean, Paul, it's still a ton, but... I mean, we whine about a lot of things, but I think we're missing some biggies. Everything else gets $1.7 trillion. Okay, just, again, I'm not going into all this. What I found was, and watch this too, when you start digging in, if, you're, if you like to research stuff and dig into facts, what I noticed was, as I was doing it, 
because uh, I'm doing all primary research, all, uh, IRS websites, government websites, how, who, what they took in. They're not allowed to lie about that stuff. They, they might, but I'm not, I'm not going conspiracy, all right? <laughs> I refuse to do that. What I found was that as I did that, I found myself getting not exactly depressed, but I kind of got churned up inside. There was kind of stuff going on. Also, I'm feeling some kind of way, as people say, inside. I uh, remember Doug talking about... Um, when we're hearing the voice of God, just quoting from Colossians, that, that, that verse about let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts. Let the peace of God be the umpire, literally is how that is. Let that be, let that be the one that calls the shots. And I found when I, when I stopped going through all that stuff and took some time to get in the presence of the Lord, all that junk lifted, and I felt good again. Listen, keep your eyes on Jesus Christ. All of us can get off. Even if you're into this thing, you have to watch because these are, these are rabbit holes, and you'll keep going through stuff. So real fast, here, here's the problem. I don't know if everybody here knows this, so that's why I'm just throwing this out real quick because I don't talk about this a whole lot. The government produces nothing. There is no, there is no income the government makes. They don't make shoes. They don't make cars. They don't make boats. They don't make planes. They don't make houses. You say, well, I mean, they build roads and all that. Yeah, but it's with your money. They're, 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 they don't make anything that they sell. There's nothing like that. The entire amount of money the government gets... Again, I'm, 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 you can argue with this, but basic thing is, is this. The entire income of the government is income and it's taxes and revenue, which means that people, somebody has to pay for all that. Currently, this is according to the Federal Reserve Bank, consumer debt is $1.14 trillion. How are these $1.14 trillion consumers, that's not counting houses, that's like your, that's like your, all, all your credit card debt and all that. Credit card debt just hit $628 billion. Credit, car, credit card debt, high interest debt that people like you and me were paying. That's, that's a new record. Uh, this is huge. Uh, if we go back just a little bit on this, I want to do it because, I, man, I, I, keep, I keep hearing about some of this stuff. And I want to skip ahead because we're going to combine this idea of the taxes with politics and economics, and there is, a, there is a potential and a current problem with this. I'm gonna, I'm not, I don't want to spend a long time on it. I, don't, I do not have an agenda on this. I just want us to get it. Um, could, could, could we pull up this graph? Would that be okay? But see it the best you can. Okay, this is, this, is, this, is, this is not the current one. You might not be able to read that real well. If you have a phone, what you can do is take a picture and expand it, and then you can watch it. That's what I do. Ha-ha. <laughs> A couple of things I want you to see, because one of the things you hear a lot is, man, I want all those fat cat billionaires to pay, pay for my stuff. It's not fair. They're not paying their fair share. Now, whether they should pay more or not isn't really the issue, but do understand what is going on. This is the, this is the truth of it, okay? The top 1% of the people, the top 1% of the earners, all those fat cats we talk about, they pay 42.3% of taxes, Everything that's collected, they pay 42% of that. 1% pays 42%. The top 1% pays more than the bottom 90% all put together. So it's not like they're paying nothing. I'm not saying they shouldn't pay more. I'm just saying, let's remember, it's not like everybody getting a free ride because I'm always, I'm hearing, and you are too, about, oh, this person got free stuff and I can't believe they pay no taxes. Well, according to the government, they do. The top 50%, and this is where I get concerned. What? Because I'm going to make a point out of this. The top 50% starts right here. It pass, it's a little bit more than that right now, but it's at 42,000. Once you're past 42,000, you're in the top 50% of taxpayers in our country, okay? The bottom 50%, half of the people that send in taxes, they pay 2.3% of all the taxes. The bottom 50% pays just over 2%, and actually it's a little bit less than that because it doesn't count tax, care and, and tax credits and child care and all that. The bottom 50% paying 2.3% of taxes. Not hating on that, I just want to make sure that we understand it. I'm going to make a point about that in a minute, so hang in there with a the thought. Um, if I went to the top, if I took the next, went up to the top 25%, let's go to here. These are people that are making $85,000 and less. If I take my 50% and add the next 25%, what's the percent I got? 50, 50 plus 25, 75. If I have 75% of the nation... Could I win an election with that? Ooh, isn't that, isn't that a pretty good, that's a good number, isn't it? If you're three to one on that, 
Okay, this, this is why I'm talking about this from a government view. I don't know if God cares about it as much as I do. I think he should. <laughs> but but I, I want to just point out this is opinion. I'm not pulling up scriptures for this, except that we're not supposed to be in debt as a nation and we're messing it. This is why it matters. A number of folks have quoted this. It comes out from different people. Uh, Franklin said something kind of like it. Uh, De Tocqueville did not say this at all. In 1787... Alexander Tyler, who was a professor at Edinburgh, he was talking about the fall of the Athenian Republic. We're going back in history now. He wasn't talking about us. He's talking about them. This is 1787. We're talking a long time ago. It says, a democracy is always temporary in nature. Listen to this. A democracy is always temporary in nature. It simply cannot exist as a permanent form of government. Here's why. A democracy will continue to exist until the time that voters discover that they can vote themselves generous gifts from the public treasury. The result will be that the majority will vote for whoever promises the most stuff. Do we have my uh, other campaign guy up there? You have his picture? Yes. Vote for Pedro. All your wildest dreams will come true. <laughs> I wanted to get the whole thing where he did it. That's, that's actually not a quote from the Bible. That's from the Napoleon Dynamite. Um, in my opinion, was that was not one of the top films ever made. Just, <laughs> but I remember that. But I remember that quote. Once, once people realize that they can vote themselves money. Once I have 50 percent that are only paying 2.3 percent of the of the thing, where are they going to vote to get money from? If the government doesn't produce it, where will it come from? It will come from the people that are in the other 50 percent. Once people realize I can, people will vote for whatever, whoever give them the most stuff. What a great thing it is to get this whole generation of college kids thinking they're going to get all free stuff because they're going to be voting for it next. But if they're not bright enough to realize all that stuff I just voted for, we're going to put on that $1.2 trillion worth of, of interest and $1.8 trillion worth of deficit each year, uh, we're, we're in trouble. And I don't really want to, I mean, ideally, wouldn't it be wonderful if we all just chipped in and paid off our national debt and got it down? I don't want to do that. And it's not just selfishness, but I do not trust our government to take that money and use it wisely and spend it on paying down the debt. I found it with people. I remember years ago, uh, we were at the lighthouse back then, and a, and a, a fellow was having trouble with his family, paying, paying off his bills, paying off his debts. Claude and I felt led to give him a little bit of, little bit of money. Came back just a few weeks later. He spent it on something else. Well, we do that too. We had a what, what they called a budget surplus, which, which meant we actually would have had a pretty balanced budget, about 2003, 2004 in there. As soon as the Congress figured out we had more money, they quickly spent it all and more. Because, we're, <laughs> guys, we're not getting ahead here. Anyway, I didn't want to spend too much of a time on this here. But it's, uh, the wicked borrow and do not repay. Don't spend more than you make. It's a warning for our nation. Start in your home. Stay out of debt. Just, just saying. Uh, I'll tell you, it's kind of funny. I wrote this down, too, just kind of interesting, because I've been hearing a lot about all the billionaires voting for Trump. He's a friend of all the billionaires. They won't, there, there are 813 billionaires in our country right now. This is Forbes magazine. They won't all tell who they're voting for, and wisely not. I wouldn't tell either, because I probably give to both sides, wanting them to be on my side if I need something. The ones that have admitted it, um, for this, this current election, 83 are for Harris, 52 are for Trump. Okay? In the 2020 election, of the ones that admitted who they, who they gave to, 48% gave to Biden, 40% for Trump. We have a myth going on that it's a whole bunch of fat cat Republicans, and I know that doesn't show everything like that, but let's just remember everybody got something. All right, let's just let's kind of keep that out of the equation and stop doing that. Yeah, we're going to pay for stuff. Heard one person. Yeah, we're going to pay. For, we're, we're going to. We're going to lower. Everybody wants to say we're going to lower taxes. One person's idea. We're, we're going to do it by raising corporate taxes. Let me tell you how that works. If you don't know basic economics, this is this is really simple. Basic basic economics. I my dad had a small corporation, so MG Reconditioning Products Incorporated. Ten, ten, ten of us work in there. Um, if they raise corporate taxes on all the corporations, ten percent. Do you think that all those corporations are going to take that hit and say, oh, gee, now we just make less? Darn. 
What, where does it go? What happens? Come on, talk to me. This isn't hard. Prices are going to go up. See, but my prices at MG can't go up just 10% because all my suppliers, it's not just the stuff that, that we're selling that's going up. It's all the stuff that's going into the sellers that's going up. So the, this wonderful tax thing that you're getting to take the taxes from these rich corporations is just going to get passed on to you and me. You're going to pay it one way or the other. Point is, get out of debt. Come on, let's not be stupid about this here. If, if my $10 thing now costs me $20 because you raised it on the corporations, I don't think I'm doing better, even if you did lower my taxes. I don't want to spend four bucks a dozen uh, for a dozen eggs, right? All right, let's, let's, we got to work at this some other ways. This is very simplistic. I get it. I want to do one more with you real fast. It, it's a warning shot for our nation. Let's start in our home. Let's get out of debt, okay? Cool, cool. Next one. This is probably the last one I'm going to get to. Galatians chapter 5, verse 14. I want to start with this. It's the idea of social justice. How many think it's good to have social justice? Now, I'm going to hit on a certain part of this, and you'll see in a minute. The entire law is summed up in a single command, love your neighbor as yourself. Say that with me. The entire law is summed up in a single command, love your neighbor as yourself. Pretty simple, right? It's good to love people. What's, what's, what do we say down here? Love God, love people. That's what we want to do. Um, Start, start scrolling down from the Proverbs 25. I just want to start, I'm going to just read these real fast to get the heart, because we're looking at a God's eye view here. If your enemy is hungry, give him food to eat. If he's thirsty, give him water to drink. In doing this, you'll heap burning coals on his head, and the Lord will reward you. Next one. On the contrary, if your enemy's hungry, feed him. If he's thirsty, give him something to drink. In doing this, you'll heap burning coals on his head. Next one. Matthew 5. I tell you, love your enemies, pray for those who persecute you, that you may be sons of your Father in heaven. He causes his son to rise on the evil and the good and sends rain on the righteous and the unrighteous. Next one. Do not mistreat an alien or oppress him, for you are aliens in Egypt. Next one. Do not oppress an alien. These are not, we're not talking about the guys from outer space with the antennas, okay? We're talking about people that are foreigners. You yourselves know how it feels to be aliens because you are aliens in Egypt. Next. When an alien lives with you in your land, do not mistreat him. The alien living with you must be treated as one of your native born. Love him as yourself. Oh, sounds like love your neighbor as yourself, doesn't it? Love him as yourself, for you were aliens in Egypt. I'm the Lord your God. What's next? Cursed is the man who withholds justice from the alien, the fatherless of the widow, that all the people shall say, Amen. <laughs> Do I have any more after that in that little list? That little part, what's after that one? Okay, I was hungry and you gave me something to eat. This is Jesus speaking. I was hungry and you gave me something to eat. I was thirsty and you gave me something to drink. I was a stranger and you invited me in. I needed clothes and you clothed me. I was sick and you looked after me. I was in prison and you came to visit me. Then the righteous will answer him, Lord, when did we see you hungry and feed you or thirsty and give you something to drink? When did we see you a stranger and invite you in or needing clothes and clothe you? When did we see you sick or in prison and go to visit you? Then the king will reply, I tell you the truth, whatever you did for one of the least of these brothers of mine, you did for me. Okay, now I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to kind of hit a little bit. You might see who this is kind of going. I'm going to hit a little bit on, on immigration, only because I don't have an agenda on this, but I'd like us to get a God's eye perspective as we, as we formulate our policies and all that. It isn't as simple as shoot the foreigners. Okay? All right? I have to be careful with this because I know as soon as I, as soon as I say something about uh, don't shoot all the foreigners, somebody's going to say, oh, so you believe we ought to have murderers and rapists loose in our country. Again, not, not, not my agenda, not what I'm going. I'm trying to live this thing out. And guess what? I want you to live this out too, and I'm not sure exactly how to do it. I'll be up front with you. I don't know exactly how to do it. I'm going to give you a couple ideas as we go. I'm going to give this a shot, but I only get like one big chance here. How do I love my neighbor as myself? Watch this. Luke chapter 10, popular and well-known passage. On one occasion, an expert in the law. He's what they, you heard about the scribes and the Pharisees and the Sadducees. This guy's what they call a nomikos. He's a legal expert. He is like really top in law. An expert in the law stood up to test Jesus. That's what they did. Teacher, he asked, what must I do to inherit eternal life? Looking for a trap. Well, Jesus says this, what's written in the law? I said, how do you read? He answered, love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul, with all your strength and all your mind. And love your neighbor as yourself. How does that sound? Does that sound good? Love God, love people? Okay. The expert in the law knew this. Jesus said, you've answered correctly. Do this and you'll live. But he wanted to justify himself, so he asked Jesus, and who is my neighbor? This is a tricky parable when you look at it. 
This is a, a powerful thing. And do the best to hear me as you can. If I hurt everybody, I guess as long as I'm equal, I don't mind. But I want to make sure I'm saying it clear. In reply, this is Jesus answering the question, who is my neighbor? Who is my brother? Who am I supposed to love? When it says, love my neighbor as myself, who is that person? In reply, this is Jesus' answer to, who is my neighbor? A man was going down from Jerusalem to Jericho when he fell into the hands of robbers. They stripped him of his clothes, beat him, and went away, leaving him half dead. A priest happened to be going down the same road, and when he saw the man, he passed by on the other side. So too a Levite, when he came to the place and saw him, passed by on the other side. But a Samaritan, as he traveled, came where the man was. And when he saw him, he took pity on him. He went to him and bandaged his wounds, pouring on oil and wine. Then he put the man on his own donkey, took him to an inn, and took care of him. The next day he took out two silver coins and gave them to the innkeeper. Look after him, he said, and when I return, I'll reimburse you for any ex extra expense you may have. Which of these three do you think was a neighbor to the man who fell into the hands of robbers? Hmm. The expert in the law replied, the one who had mercy on him. Jesus told him, go and do likewise. This is another one of these God's eye view things because I don't want to be on the wrong side of this. All right, I want, to, I want to see stuff as God sees it. Who's my neighbor? Well, a guy from Texas Christian went into a Texas Longhorns game, and the, some of the fans there took offense at him, and they beat him up, and they left him by the side of the stadium naked and bleeding. The preachers came by, and they, they said, we don't like Texas Christian, and left him there. Democrats and Republicans walked by, and we don't go with Texas Christian. We're Longhorns fans. They walked by, and they left him there. And finally, a guy named... Maybe Pedro. <laughs> Comes by in his cousin's pickup truck, picks him up, puts him in, takes care of him, takes him to a place, feeds him, clothes him, gets him set right. He was an illegal immigrant. Who was the one that acted like a neighbor? Pedro. <laughs> that's, why, that's why you vote for Pedro. All your dreams will come true. <laughs> now there's I want to say it before I say anything else fine build the wall do you know how hard it is to build that doggone wall do you know how long that wall is do you know we got 2,000 miles of border just with Mexico that's me driving from here to where we go in Maine five times back and forth do you know how big that wall is it takes me all day to drive that far. That's, this is a big wall. Some places you can't build it. Some places it's in the middle of the river. Some places it's across tribal lands. Some places it's on uh, mountains you can't get to. It, it, it's kind of it's challenging. Uh, but if you, if you want, again, nothing against the wall. I'm not saying bring in the rapists. F okay? All right? Again, I'm talking political stuff. This is not my favorite stuff to talk about, but I do like us to have, have a, at least the God's eye picture on this. Okay? Easy. This is, these are from ICE stats. You all heard of ICE, Immigration and Culture, Customs Enforcement. They're, um, they always talk about them when they're trying to pick up the people and the, the illegal immigrants, wherever they may be. Currently in detention with ICE, there are 38,500 approximately, because that changes. There were 1.8 million cases in the fiscal year 2024. Most of them still need to be heard. They have a backlog, in addition to that, of 3.7 million cases. There are millions of people that are currently in detention or waiting on hold to get their cases heard. This is how we do it. We have a process. They have to go to judges. There are 682 federal judges that are appointed to hear these cases. That's over 5,000 cases per judge. Each judge last year, they averaged 975. Do the math. You know, it's, like, it's like that thing about the, the, the two trains, when the, the train car 50 miles an hour and the, and the other one going 20 miles an hour. How long does it take for whatever from to smash, whatever they do? Huh? It's, it's one of those kind of things. How long, when we keep adding, <laughs> if we keep adding um, a million cases a year, how long before those, not, those 682 judges are going to be able to hear all the cases? The answer is never. It's never going to get done. So... I'm going to jump ahead. So I'm not advocating open border. That isn't what I'm talking about. How about, this is what I have a picture of. Here's all the people that would like to follow some sort of legal path to get to our country. If I'm desperate to get out of where I am, I'm in cartel land or have no money or I'm poor, my family's dying, and I'm desperate to get free, 
How many years is, my, is it going to be before my case comes up and I'm allowed in this country? We have made it impossible, at least from people from Honduras and Mexico and where a lot of them are coming from, from the south, to get in here. We have this, all these people going into this. I know that looks like a delicious ice cream cone, but what it is is a back, is a back. It's never, it's never going to squish out the bottom of that thing. If, if we, I think all of us would probably agree, hey, let's have a fair legal process because I want people vetted before they come in, right? Okay, and, and, and these are some of the things you have to watch because stuff gets thrown around. I don't, I don't want to spend too much time on this because I, I want to get through this, but a um, couple ideas. Congress approved funds for 40,520 beds last year. ICE detained 55,000 people. How's that working out? Are we treat, treating people well? No. From, 20 to, from 2002 to 2024, we spent 24 times as much on ICE and Border Patrol as on the immigration court system. In 2024, we spent $3.4 billion in detention centers, all the jails, all the places we keep all these people that are coming in. We spent $424 million on U.S. citizenship and immigration services. And we spent $840 million on immigration court. What that means is we spent three times more to hold people than we did to move them on. You see what I'm saying? So don't take just a simplistic view of this thing here. We need to fix the bottom. If, if I'm going to do this, you know what I want? You know how I'm going to fix that? I need a bigger funnel. I've got to have some other way to do this. We've got to triple the amount of court justices, and these people, some of them want to become citizens. It's, and you might say, well, pastor, don't you know how many that, uh, that are criminals in this country now? Yeah, I know exactly how many there are. They told us, 435,719. Actually, that isn't even true, because there's another 226,847 pending cases. There's a lot of people who just can't get through this funnel. Um, and it's funny because it was kind of talked about it and it made it sound like it all came in under Biden, but at the end of Trump's time, there were 405,786 people. Same, same 405,786 people. That was after Trump's term was done. I'm just saying that immigration pro problem issue has been going on for a long time. How about we talk less about put them all in jail and figure out some way to fix the other end of this thing so we can get... I was going to say something really tacky, like get them out landscaping my house, but that would be wrong. I'm not going to say that. <laughs> there, there was an old song about immigration boy about they're, they're taking away all our best jobs, our dishwashing, our landscaping, and picking our fruit. It's like, bro, come on, you know. <laughs> Just saying. <laughs> A God's eye view is, and, and again, there's tons more stuff. I wound up with pages of stats on immigration and all this stuff here. N not really going there. What was interesting is the immigrants that have come in, statistically, according to ICE, they're less likely to break at least federal laws than the people in this country. Even in this illegal pool that already had criminal records, they're less likely to break the law. Now, again, that's a, it's only a partial statistic because that's federal, and I don't really know about the state and local. So maybe our immigrants are more likely to break those laws. I don't, I don't know, but I'm saying there's a lot of moving parts in this picture. God calls us to love people. Can we work at that? Can we agree that it's good to love people? I do not have a solution for this, except I know I want to love people. I don't have a problem with a wall, but that won't solve the problem. Just, do you understand why? Because we're never going to get through that backlog. It's not going to work. I don't have a problem with vetting people. I want them vetted. I don't want bad people coming into my house. But can we, let's, let's get them vetted then. Let's do it. Let's not just talk about it. Let's actually get her done. I think we need more of that. I, hear me clearly. I think we have an obligation to protect our neighbor, to protect our nation, protect our borders. Nehemiah, build a wall. I'm cool with that. All right? I don't, I don't have a problem with that. But I, I do want to make sure that our number one view is not how can I keep everybody out, but how can I live according to the law of God, loving my neighbor as myself? How can I be like the good Samaritan and not like everybody else? That's a call for us Christians. That's us. God's solution. Let's love as Jesus loved. Second thing, let's put, in, let's put money into the judge's courts. Let's put money into that whole infrastructure and get people out of jail and pro make a process and a path to citizenship. You know, bring them in or send them home. I don't really care what, but just don't leave them locked up. It, it costs a lot of money to leave people in prison. Yeah, tell me about Camilla's family. She's like that. You know, it's, it's all that. <laughs> I, have, I have a daughter-in-law from Argentina has, has trouble with that. Her, her mother couldn't come up here for, for Joe's and her wedding. 
was allowed in the country because they were afraid she wouldn't go back. I've got another son on the other side. He's, he's an immigrant, a foreigner over in Norway. Had to get special permission to be in there. and Had to be special permission to stay in there. He's, he's still not a citizen yet. He speaks the language. He's got the equivalent of almost a PhD over there. He's not a citizen. Every one of us that's here, we are not indigenous to this country. We're all immigrants. My grandpa came over in 1920. Earned two degrees at the University of Chicago, went on to teach it, teach it as, as a pastor for years, church planted, and uh, taught at Wheaton College for years, Ph.D. Just, let, let's, let's make this thing happen. And nationally, I don't know. If you said, Kim, how can we absorb all those people? I would say, I don't know. I don't have answers to all this, but I'd like us to have more than just simplistic questions. I want to have immigration more than just talking points. All right? Let's think. How do I love people? What did you say, Claudia? Yep. This is, this is really the heart of God because I'm feeling it. How can we live up to our Christian ideals and our Christian principles? I want us all to be safe. I've got kids, lots of them. I want them safe. For most of them, it would be caveat emptor, meaning don't mess with them. You, you'll be sorry. That's a very loose translation of the, of the Latin, <laughs> but you get the idea. The Statue of Liberty on the base, most of us know the end of it, but it's from a poem called The New Colossus. And it says, from her beaconed hand glows worldwide welcome. From her beaconed hand glows worldwide welcome. This is back in the late 1800s. Most of us know this part. Give me your tired, your poor, your huddled masses yearning to be free. The wretched refuse of your teeming shore. Send these, your homeless tempest tossed to me. I lift my lamp beside the golden door. I don't know how to do this. I would like to see us as Christians try. I would like to at least see us care. That's a God's high view. I don't want my first response as a Christian to be go away. I think I'm missing it. I think I'm on the wrong side of it. That happened before, too, when somebody had a place to stay, didn't it? Love God, love people. A whole lot more issues we could look at, but I'm going to stop right there. I want you to vote this, this coming week, this coming Tuesday. Pray for wisdom for who to vote for. We spent a month learning how to hear the voice of God. I think God can teach us how to vote. I don't have a clear answer to that. Uh, people say, oh, pastors aren't allowed to tell you. I could tell you if I felt like it. I'm just not going to. I don't want to. I don't have to. You can't make me. <laughs> it's my First Amendment right. <laughs> vote. Pray for wisdom because we don't know how to put all these pieces together. I know God does. Maybe neither candidate will put any of these pieces together. I don't know. God does. But what I definitely know is that God knows the end from the beginning. What I, what I am aware of is that God knows what's coming up in the next four years, and I don't. I don't know who's going to do better with border. I don't know who's going to do better with international policy. I don't know who's going to do better with marriage and family. I don't know who's going to do better with taxes and economy. I don't know if anybody's going to mess with the debt. I don't, I don't have the answers to any of those things. The only one who knows is going to be God. And I'm just saying, God help. We sing God bless America. Could we just pray God, God help America? Yeah. Let's stand together for prayer. Father, we just we face nations that we don't really have the wisdom to deal with, but you do. I'm praying, God, for leadership that will ask you. <laughs> Maybe we could turn some corners here. I pray, God, that we will not collapse as a, that Scottish economist thought we had to. I pray, God, we'll turn this thing around. I pray, Lord, we'll learn to love one another as we love ourselves. I pray, God, that we'll love you and we'll love people. I pray, God, we'll answer correctly the question, who is my neighbor? I pray, Lord, we'll learn to live as Jesus lived, love as Jesus loved, touching the lepers, the unclean, the people that nobody else wanted. Thank you, God. you got a heart in all this. Say this with me. Dear Lord, I pray for my nation. I pray for our leadership. I pray for this election. 
May your kingdom come and your will be done. In Jesus' name, amen.